Good morning, Highland Church. It's good to have you all here today. And it's great excitement that we have the band here to play. I think as far as, as long as I've been here, this is a record for the earliest band uh, performance that we've had. So congratulations to the Highland Academy Band. We're happy to have you here. And Mr. Alvarez, we got the band here and the leader here. We got the whole building covered. So I do have several things to mention, and I'm going to try to not have too many thumbs and confuse myself here. Um, and I started out not too great by not even having this here and ready to go. So welcome to you. If you are visiting us today, we are thrilled that you're here. I've talked with a few people who are visitors. We would love it if you would uh, look in the pew that is right in front of you and put a, fill out one of those little blue cards. that we got a picture of it up there. It asks for a lot of information. Just put as much as you're interested in. Um, we use it for a lot of different purposes. Just go ahead and fill that out, and when it comes time, you, you can give, put it in the offering plate, which is back through those double doors, or give it to any of the elders or deacons or myself. We'd love to know that you're here. If you're wanting to transfer your membership in, which we have some of that we're going to be doing today, that's, that card is for that use as well. And then the third use for that card that we are doing, we've been doing now most of the summer, is you can put your prayer request on there. I'd encourage you to actually put your prayer request on now so that when it comes time to bring them forward, it's already written out. Uh, during our prayer song, you can come forward and put your uh, prayer request in. I think we'll actually put it in Dr. Um, in Dr. Ruckel's, no, um, Pastor Will's Bible, um, if you'll collect them, because I'll be playing my guitar. I can't do it there. So you can put them in Pastor Will's Bible, and he'll be praying for those prayer requests. Well, all the elders will be praying for them. They're distributed to the elders. So, um, so that's something to keep in mind. Also, we have a digital way of letting us know that you're here. Just send a text message. And the text message is HSDA. That's the message you put in there for Highland Seventh-day Adventist. And to send it to the number 84576. When you send that message, then you can, it'll, it'll send back a question to answer or something. And we'll know that you're here. We can welcome you but we won't put you on a mailing list or anything like that. So um, happy to have you here. So we have uh, several families who are transitioning, uh, two families who are moving into our church, and let's see if they're here today. Uh, Vaughn and Melissa Wiesner, are you, are you over, probably over here at the school? I'm not seeing your hand up here. I guess I'm not seeing them, but they're, they've been anxious for their membership to transfer now for several uh, months. They just happened this week, apparently be elsewhere. And we also have um, Matthew, Nicole, Tristan, and Aiden that are coming in from the Bloomington SDA Church in Bloomington, Indiana. I know they are here because I saw them earlier today, right, right back there. All right, so we, we're happy to welcome them in as well. And so, is there a motion to welcome them into our fellowship? A second. All in favor say welcome. welcome. All right. You're officially part of the Highland Seventh-day Adventist Church. We also have Matthew Hartman, the son of our former pastor, several pastors, a couple of pastors back. He is transferring his membership to the Madison Campus SDA Church, and we're glad that he has found a membership, a church to be a member of there. Um, and so is there a motion to transfer him to Madison campus? A second? All right, all in favor say aye. Or we should say, um, God bless you. So there you go. All right. A couple other things that are coming up. One is we have, there's been a little bit of confusion. This Wednesday is the fifth Wednesday of this month. So we are not doing an identity crisis talk during Wednesday. We're doing a regular prayer meeting. And so the, we're doing it on the first and third Wednesdays. So I encourage you to come out for prayer meeting. We had some people come for prayer meeting last week that were expecting the identity crisis talk, and I think they were blessed by it anyway. So come on out and pray with us. That's Wednesday at 6.30. And this evening at 6, we have our ice cream social. Now, this was going to be last week, but then we thought it was supposed to rain, 
and then it didn't rain, but we'd already canceled it. So this week, there's no expectation of rain, at least today. Tomorrow there is, but so come on out, bring your ice cream. I hope it survived in your freezer for one week. Bring your ice cream scoops, bring your lawn chair. It'll be on the front campus. You don't even need to go inside, just right there on the front campus. There'll be a Vespers, the ice cream. And so my daughter was thrilled because it's her birthday. So she'll get plenty of ice cream on her birthday. So um, thanks to the weather for moving the ice cream social to celebrate Amy's birthday. Um, all right. Now, those are all the things in the bulletin. We have a couple of other important things having to do with our evangelism committee. One is out in the foyer. You will notice on each table we have the invitations for our car show that will be part of our evangelistic meeting in October. So the meeting starts on Friday, but the car show will be on Sunday. Our evangelist is the cousin of Dale Earnhardt Sr., the NASCAR driver, and has been involved in the NASCAR scene his whole life, his whole career. And so he has found that a lot of times people will come out and enjoy a car show. Now, this isn't NASCAR show because, I mean, how many NASCARs are in this area? But it's classic cars. We know this area loves classic cars. There's, every Saturday they have one during the summertime up um, in Portland. So what I would encourage you to do is grab these, and if you know of any car show or anybody who has a classic car, grab one and give it to them and say, hey, we would love for you to come to this car show. So those are out there. If we run out, we'll print more. I would love to run out of these things, but there you go. That's for this, and here's the other thing. How many, when was the last time you got a personally handwritten letter in the mail? It's been a while, hasn't it? If you did get a personally handwritten letter in the mail, did you open it up and read it? Yes. So we are, the evangelism committee has decided, let's have the personal touch. We are in a very digital, impersonal world, and we can never out-entertain the world, but the devil and the world should never be able to out-love the church. And one way of showing love is by a personal touch. So we have, right here, we have these packets set up. I forget how many there are. In each packet, there are the names of four, four people or families who are connected with this church in some way, but are not regularly attending at this point for whatever reason. It could be COVID, it could be that they haven't been for years, we don't know. And let me just make a, a qualification to this so that no one is offended. We've gone over this list several times. I say we as in myself, Rhonda, our secretary, our evangelism committee, and every single time we found a mistake. So I am not certifying that your name isn't on the list. In fact, the last time I went through the list, I found somebody that I see every single Sabbath in church was still on the list. Somehow, we managed to not take her off the list, so she's off the list. But, so if you see the name on the list, please, if you see your name on the list, please don't be offended. We tried our best, but our best is not perfect. Um, but we would rather invite more people than less people. Right? We'd rather send an invitation to somebody who did come and somehow we missed it than have somebody miss. So what we're asking, and let me be very specific on this, we're asking people to volunteer to take one of these packets. Each packet has four names on it, and there is a form letter on there, and there is four pieces of stationery and four envelopes. We want you to handwrite the letter and hand address the envelope, and in return address, you can put the church's return address on there, but all by hand, no typing. And then go ahead and put the letter in unsealed. Don't seal it yet because we'll be adding a flyer, a, an invitation to the meetings when we get them. So bring them back to the church office, and then when we get them, we'll stuff the flyers in and mail them out. Does that sound fair? All right, and so we divided up. We figured each person could probably handle four. That's not, that's not too many letters for somebody to write. But please do it soon. Um, like if you get it, try to get it done this week so that we can know that they're there so we don't have to start hounding you to, to bring them back. And then we'll just hold them until the appropriate time. Sound fair? Any questions on that? Where do we get them? Great. So Tanya, raise your hand, Tanya. Tanya will be in the foyer after church with all of these. 
and um, she will go ahead and give them to you when you request. So I appreciate your attention for that. I know that took a little bit longer, but I think that's a very important announcement that I wanted to make sure we're clear on. Yeah, Dr. Ruckel? A date? Yeah, so the letter has the details. Now, the letter doesn't have a lot of details about the meeting, like all the specifics, because we'll be putting in a, a handbill in there as well. So there'll be a professionally printed invitation that's got all the details. So the letter is, is a little bit shorter like that. But it does have the basic start date and stuff. Yeah. Yeah, this is for our, this is for our prophecy seminar that starts in Oct on October 28th. Yes, it'll be a shorter seminar than the last one, 10 days, but um, it should be a blessing. All right, so I think that's all of the announcements I had to make, and we are going to have a wonderful worship service today. I'm so happy to have you all involved with it. I'd like to invite Dr. Ruckel to come up and share about our offering. Happy Sabbath. The offering today is very important. It's called Kentucky, Tennessee Advance. What does that mean? 40% goes to conference evangelism. 37.5 goes to Highland Academy. 12.5 goes to Madison Academy. And 10% to any Creek camp. So please stand uh, as we have prayer for this offering. Dear Lord, thank you for the Sabbath and for this service here. And I just pray that you would bless this offering abundantly. These are very important ministries. And we ask for your blessing. In Jesus' name, amen. Please remain standing. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. Let's sing together. Two.
may be seated. It's time now for the children's story. We'd like to invite the kids to come forward, and um, we'd also like to encourage them to come on this side here so that they're not um, bothered by all the instruments over there. So kids can come forward. The offering that they collect goes for children's ministry at Highland Church. All right, looks like we're, we've got a smaller group of kids than normal here. I think still some are coming up. So my story today takes place in two places, but the first place is a city called Kamasai, Ghana. That's an African country. Ghana is an African country, and Kamasai is a city in that city. And missionary Murray Brown was in the fifth floor of the hospital there, and he was in bad shape. Somehow, and I don't know how it was, he had been involved in an explosion. And so his arms were all burned. His legs were all burned. His abdomen was all burned, and his right hand was so badly burned that the doctor said, we're going to have to take skin from one part of your body and sew it onto your hand in order for it to heal because it won't heal on its own. And so when they put him in the hospital, do you know what they do when you have all those burns on you? They wrap you up. They wrap you and wrap you and wrap you. So his left hand was all wrapped up tight. His right arm was all wrapped up tight. He had wrappings around here. He had wrappings around there. He, had, he couldn't move. He was just stuck in the bed. His head was fine. Yes. But the rest of his body was all badly burned. And it was morning. The sun was just starting to come up. And he saw a line of African army ants marching in order, right through the window, across the floor, up the foot of his bed, and right onto his bed, and they crawled right toward him. Now, we have ants in America, right? But we don't have African army ants. African army ants are carnivores. That means they eat animals. And they, they're small. Well, they're big for ants, but they're small creatures. But when you get a whole bunch of them, they can eat a whole deer or, or a whole, they've been known to just eat up people who are stuck and can't get away. Even elephants run away from these ants. They're so scary. And so you, could, you can imagine 
why missionary Murray Brown became very afraid when he saw these ants marching toward him because could he move? No, he was all tied up. And so here he was in the bed, all wrapped up, and he couldn't go anywhere. And he saw the ants coming toward him, and he called, Help! But you know what? There was no one to help him. In America, we have nurses day and night in our hospitals. But in this hospital, the nurses all went home at night, and they hadn't come in in the morning yet. And so he was saying, Help! And no one could hear him. And as he's crying out, help, he's watching. And the ants started crawling underneath his bandages. And he could feel their tickly legs on, their, on his bandages. And he cried out, help, is there anyone to help me? And the third time he cried out, help. Well, meanwhile... Across the country, across the world, in a city that I have been to called Scotts Bluff, Nebraska, Ray right over here, if you look back right there, this is Kamasai, all the way over here, if you flew it, it would be a one day and two hour flight. That's what Google says, that's how long it would take, and it would cost you $1,884 to fly there. Um... It's a long ways away. But there in Scotts Bluff, there was a man who was a friend with Missionary Brown, and he was sleeping because it was nighttime there. It's morning in Ghana, but it was nighttime in Scotts Bluff. And he was sleeping, and he heard a sound. He heard, help! Well, this guy thought maybe one of his kids was calling, so he got up and checked on the kids, and the kids were... <laughs> they were sleeping. I guess they're okay. He went back to bed and he heard, is there somebody to help me? And he got up out of bed and he, he went to check on his kids again. And, and one more, he went back to bed and one more time he heard, please somebody help me. And he woke up his wife. This time he remembered, he recognized his voice. He woke up his wife and he said, I heard missionary Murray Brown calling for help. Something must be wrong. Let's pray for him. So they got out of bed, they knelt down beside their bed, and they started praying for missionary Murray Brown. And when they started praying, the ants, the ants, they were all in a line getting underneath his bandages. They turned around, and they started marching back out the other way, out from under his bandages, down the bed leg, across the floor, and out of his room. And Missionary Brown fell asleep again, content knowing that God had him under his care. Well, when the doctor came in that morning, he told, he told the doctor about the ants that had come. And the doctor said, oh, no, you're going to be all chewed up under there. So he took the bandages off. And not only was there not any ant bites, but his hand that was not supposed to be able to heal on itself had already started to heal. And missionary Murray Brown ended up with just one scar on his thigh, so he had a, a remembrance of this happening. Otherwise, he was perfectly fine. And it was several months later before he talked to his friend back in Scotts Bluff, Nebraska, and his friend said, hey, I heard your voice calling for help, and we prayed for you on this certain day. And he said, that's when I was in the hospital, and that's when the ants turned around. Is it a true story somebody asked? I was told it was a true story. I don't know Missionary Brown myself, but I do know Scott's Bluff um, as a place. And that is, was told as a true story. And Pastor John today is going to be talking about prayer and the power of prayer. So we've had an example of that, and I hope that you'll be listening to hear other examples of how prayer can be powerful in your life. Thank you. You can go back to your seats.
All right, our first song is What a Friend We Have in Jesus. You can put it in the Bible with the blue cards, and you can come up and kneel.
Lord God, our Father. Lord, you are in heaven, Lord. You can see everything that's going on down here. So, Lord, we thank you for this privilege of prayer. Lord God, help us to recognize that prayer is just as powerful as you are. So, Lord, help us to to pray to you more. Lord God, I thank you for these uh, prayer requests that have been turned in, Lord. Lord, I pray that you would just be working out your will in each situation. Lord, I think of my brothers and sisters up here kneeling with me this morning, Lord, whatever is on their hearts, Lord Jesus. We are calling all the power of heaven, all the power of you, our omnipotent God, Lord, to be at work in each situation, Lord God. Help us to be at work with you, Lord. Open our eyes to what you're trying to do in our lives. In each situation, Lord, we want your will to be done. We want to work with your will, Lord Jesus. Lord God, we thank you. We praise you for bringing us through another week. Thank you that we can be here in the house of the Lord this morning with our brothers and sisters to worship you together, to hear your word, Lord God, as you just bless Pastor John with your words, Lord Jesus. Help us to truly listen and apply your words to our lives. Lord Jesus, I do want to lift up two of our brothers and sisters that are in need of prayer, Lord. They are in need of healing. Kathleen Fisk and Samuel Payne, Lord God, we pray for healing for them. Lord Jesus, I want to lift up our conference to you, Lord Jesus. Our conference officers, Lord, they're standing in the need of prayer. We, we need you to bring a resolution, peace, and understanding there, Lord Jesus. Lord God, we thank you for Highland Academy. We thank you for Highland Elementary School, Lord. Use these institutions. We thank you for these young people. Lord, just continue to lead and guide them. What a, what a crazy world it is they're, they're having to grow up in. Lord, we just pray for a special outpouring of your spirit on their lives. Lord, we we rebuke Satan in the name of Jesus from trying to distract our young people and our old people, our middle-aged people as well, Lord Jesus. Help us to focus on you, Lord God. God, again, we are just praying for your Holy Spirit to fill this place as we worship you, as you're going to speak your word through Pastor John, Lord God. May we encounter you as my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Happy Sabbath. This morning our scripture reading comes from 2 Chronicles 20, 12. O our God, wilt thou not judge them? For we have no might against the great company that cometh against us. Neither know we what to do, but our eyes are upon thee.
Amen. Praise the Lord, band. Thank you. We are blessed to have the band with us so early in the year, like you said. Thank you, Mr. Alvarez in Highland Academy Band. Um, it's my privilege to introduce our guest speaker this morning. Um, this summer, I began to look for our week of prayer speaker, and I had somebody lined up. You know, when you say, hey, will you speak for us? They said, oh, yes, just let me pray about it. And you're like, all right, check. And then they called me back and they said, yeah, no, I'm not going to do it. I'm like, oh. So I was tempted to worry about it. But did I pray about it? Yes, I did. And, and uh, I thought about, um, uh, I had taken a summer course online during lockdown, during 2020. Um, and uh, it was a course from Southern. And um, when they would divide us up in these little breakout rooms, uh, John Rimatera was in one of those breakout rooms. And I remembered, man, he had some really deep, impactful spiritual points that he made. And I thought of John, and turns out he was speaking for the young adults at camp meeting. And so I saw him there, and I said, this is it. This is the one. Is this the one, Lord? He said, that's the one. So I went and talked to John uh, when he was uh, speaking there in the library, and he just said yes. He said, he, yes, he would, he would do our week of prayer. And uh, John has just finished doing the week of prayer this week, and we're so glad that he has agreed to preach uh, at church this Sabbath. I know you're going to be blessed. This is this is one of the best week of prayer speakers that I've heard since I've been here, and I mean that with all sincerity. Um, you're going to be blessed by the ministry of John Rimatera this morning. John is a pastor in the uh, Lake Cumberland District in Kentucky. That's around the Somerset area. Um, he's a young man in his 30s, uh, <laughs> obviously of Filipino heritage, as you'll see with this shirt. Uh, anyways, John, we just want to thank you for being here, and we gave uh, John a thank you card last night signed by all of our students, but you know what? We wanted to give you some uh, free items from the Highland Academy Souvenir Gift Shop as well to remember us by. Just to say thanks again for being here this week. Wow. Um, don't hype me up too much. It has been an absolute pleasure to be here at Highland Academy this week. I just want to thank uh, Pastor Will for the invitation. And I just want to affirm uh, the leadership, the staff of this academy. You have excellent staff here at Highland. Can we just give them a hand? Praise God for them. Yeah. Praise God. And I got to say, you guys have such awesome kids as well. They've been putting up with me all week, so I think that deserves... <laughs> Praise God. It has been a delight to speak on the subject of prayer. And I had shared this at the beginning of the week that I have done many weeks of prayer, but it is rare that we actually talk about prayer during week of prayer. You would think that that would be something that, I don't know, you would actually do during week of prayer, but it's rare that we actually pray and talk about prayer in week of prayer. So I'm I was challenged by the subject of, but I prayed about it, and we were exploring that this whole week about prayer. Why do we pray? How do we pray? How do we do all these things? And I'm glad that we were able to wrestle with God about prayer. Before we get further into the message this morning, bow with me as we pray together. Father in heaven, I want to thank you for being our God. I want to thank you for your love, your grace, your compassion, your mercy, your overwhelming love for us. I want to thank you, God, for these precious Sabbath hours where we can spend here together in this space to hear your voice. God, I stand before your people merely as your servant. I pray, Lord, that you are able to speak clearly in spite of me. Forgive me and empty me of myself. And, Lord, I pray for your Holy Spirit to pour out and overflow because I believe, Lord, that this message was custom-made for somebody in this place. If not someone in this place, then just me. So, God, speak to us now. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Prayer is easy. It's easy when things are going well. It's easy to thank God and praise Him and sing these songs of praise and thanksgiving when things are going well. The family is good. The family is healthy. The finances are great. 
church life is going well, it's easy to pray during those times. But what happens when the times are not as good? What happens when things come crashing down around you? What happens when things are just going so well and then it does complete turnaround and it seems like the world is against you? How easy is it to pray then? When things go down, when times get tough, when the crisis comes, I wonder, is God a first option or a last resort? Now, I want you to think about that question, because so often the pious part of us says, oh yeah, I pray, I throw myself on the altar. But if we're honest with ourselves, God is often the last resort rather than the first option. The text I want to explore you with you today is found in 2 Chronicles chapter 20. Now, we read the, the text for our study, but there's always a context. There's always a background to that verse. And they always tell us if you do good preaching, if you want to be a good Bible student, you always have to understand the context. What is the story surrounding the text that we read? You're reading from the New King James Version. You are welcome to follow in whatever version that you wish. We begin in verse 1. Here's what it says. And it happened after this that the people of Moab with the people of Ammon and others with them, besides the Ammonites, came to battle against Jehoshaphat. So the first thing that sticks out to me in this passage is after, as it, it happened or after these things. And the question that we have to ask ourselves as we approach this text is, what happened? You see, King Jehoshaphat had just risen to power. He was a young king of Judah. He was one of those kings, the good kings of Judah, in, in a line of good kings, bad kings. And this particular king, Jehoshaphat, rose in power. He tore down these idols. He brought the people back to the worship of God. He increased the stature of the nation. He increased the military might of Judah. He allied even with Ahab, who was defeated in the last chapter. This was not just a young king, but he was a strong king. He was an established king. He was a king that was worthy of respect and prestige. And you would think that God blessing him because of his faithfulness, you would think that God would make it just a little bit easy for him. Have you ever been there? Have you ever been there when... You're trying to do everything right. And things come crashing down. Give me a break, God. The story tells us that after these things happened, his establishment as a good, strong, pious king in Judah, that these nations that surrounded Jerusalem started making their way to attack. If you actually look at the map of that area, these three tribes or these three nations, among others, surrounded Jerusalem on all three sides, and their backs were against the proverbial, their backs were against the wall because all they had to flee to was the sea. You ever been there where you felt yourself back into a wall with no way out? Maybe I'm talking to somebody here that's struggling with finances. Maybe I'm talking to a student that doesn't know where the student aid is going to come from, and they don't know if they're going to come back to Highland Academy next semester. Maybe I'm talking to somebody that's about to lose their home or lose their marriage. Their backs are against the wall. That's where Jehoshaphat was at this moment in time. And I want you to notice... Verse 2, then some came and told Jehoshaphat, saying, A great multitude is coming against you beyond the sea from Syria, and they are, Hez, uh, are in Hazazon Tamar, which is in Gedi. And Jehoshaphat feared and set himself to seek the Lord and proclaim the fast throughout Judah. 
I want you to notice what is being said here. So after he's being told about all these armies that are coming against him, understand this, that he was already blooded in battle. He already was in battle. He had a military. But we see here that as he heard the news of what was coming, he became afraid. I've often heard it said that if you are a faithful person, you shouldn't be afraid. But that's not true. We all get afraid of something. We are fearful of something. The issue for a person of faith is not whether or not they fear, it's where their feed leads them to. Because so often when we become afraid of something, oftentimes what I see people fleeing to is their money, the family, all these other things to self-medicate. You know what I'm talking about. You go to everywhere else except for God. God's not your first option. He's your last resort. But we see here that King Jehoshaphat, amidst all of his power, amidst all of his wealth, turns to God. He turns to God. And not only that, watch what it says. He set himself to seek the Lord. I love how it's constructed in Hebrew. Because when we see set, it's almost a set in place. But his eyes, all of attention, every single ounce of his focus is on God. He set himself to seek the Lord, and then he proclaimed a fast. Now, most of us can't go until 12 o'clock on a Sabbath because you need to eat lunch. Whenever we talk about fasting, it's always about, oh man, I, I have to get rid of food. The basis of fasting, people of God, is not to deprive yourself of food, is that every time you hear your stomach growl because of your want for food, you are reminded that you need more than just food. You need God, and you need God in a serious way. Does anyone here need God in a serious way this morning? The text continues. It says, He proclaimed a fast through all Judah. And I recognize that this whole concept of proclaiming a fast among the people it seems foreign for us because in the West we are very proud of being individualistic. It's my problem. I'll deal with it. I don't want to involve anybody else. And unfortunately, we practice the same even in the church. We don't like to tell people about our issues. Maybe we'll tell that pious sister, can you pray for me? Oh, yes, absolutely. But when things really go down, when things really get serious, I wonder how many of us can say confidently, I can go to my church family and say, I need prayer, let's fast about it. Because there is power in the community of God. There is power in the community of faith. When we pray individually to God, it is powerful. Imagine the multiplicity effect when each of us fast and pray together. I've heard it said that you will actually see the health, the spiritual health of a church based on their prayer meeting. I have found in my years as a pastor that prayer meeting like communion, is probably one of the most least attended places or rather services that we have in the church. And it leads me to wonder why. We see here that this king goes to God first and then he invites the nation of Judah to come with him, to him, to pray, to seek God and verse 5, then Jehoshaphat stood in the assembly of Judah and Jerusalem and in the house of the Lord before the new court, before his new government, before his nobles. And he said this, watch this, verse 6. And he said, O Lord God of our fathers, are you not God in heaven? And do you not rule over all the kingdoms of the nations? And in your hand there is not power and might so that no one is able to withstand you? Are you not our God who drove out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel and gave it to the descendants of Abraham, your friend forever? And, 
and, and they dwell in it, and they have built you a sanctuary in it for your name, saying, if disaster comes upon us, sword, judgment, pestilence, or famine, we will stand before this temple and in your presence, for your name is in this temple, and cry out to you in our affliction, and you will hear and say, this is probably one of the most comprehensive prayers that you can find in Scripture. Because what you find here is that this king is now looking to God, reminding God as if God needs a reminder. I love it when we try to remind God of things. It's like, yeah, you know, you remember when you said this? You told me you were going to show up, and we should. Because if God said it, and, he's go and he said that he was going to follow through. Perhaps people of God, we should probably claim it. He's saying, look God, you were the one that brought our ancestors here. You were the one that gave us the land. You were the one that gave us the means and the ability to raise up this temple. You were the one that told us that if we were in trouble, whether in pestilence or war, if we came to this place, if we prayed in this space and we prayed by faith, you were going to follow through. And I wonder, can we find that same kind of boldness today? The text continues where he says, And now, and now, here are the people of Ammon, Moab, Mount Seir, whom you would not let Israel invade when they came out of the land of Egypt, but they turned from them and did not destroy them. Here they are rewarding us by coming to throw us out of your presence, which you have given us to inherit. O oh Lord our God, will you not judge them? I want you to hear that almost desperation in his voice. Have you been there? Have you been in that place with God where you were so desperate for him to answer? Asking God, we need you. I need you to show up. God, you said that you were going to be there. Now all these things are happening. But I want you to notice the next statement that comes, and it just blows my mind of how simple it is, but how not simplistic it is. It is one of the most powerful statements of faith that I believe that as a community of faith that we need to recover today. Here's what it says. It says, For we have no power against this great multitude. That's the first part. It's a recognition that no matter what we do, no matter what we try, no matter how hard we try, we have no power over our problems. We have no power over our situation. It is a full recognition that Nothing we can do can change the outcome. And there is only one person that can. Watch what it says here. Don't miss this. Underline this in your Bible. Highlight it. Highlight it in your Bible app. Whatever it is. Don't miss this. Add this to your prayer life. It says, For we do not know what to do, but our eyes are on you. <sighs> I felt that. We don't know what to do, but our eyes are on you. Don't miss that, people of God. That is a statement of humility, but also a statement of utmost confidence that God is going to follow through. We don't know what to do about our conference. We don't know what to do about our finances. We don't know what to do about our families. But we know that if our eyes are on you, You'll follow through. So the text continues to tell us that as he gathers the people to him in Judah, in Jerusalem, they start to pray together. They pray together. And we find that as they are coming together, notice this, verse 13, all of Judah, not just the men, not just the pious people, it tells us with their little ones, their wives, their children, and they all stood before God. Mm, that kind of sounds like a church service. It doesn't sound like a teen revival. It doesn't sound like a children's church. It doesn't sound like an adults-only program. Prayer is for all of us. And if we have a problem, that means we pray together. 
That means that from the oldest to the youngest, we all, when we come together and pray and see God's face, there is power in there. Oh, what would the church look like today, people of God, if we humbled ourselves and came together and prayed that simple prayer? We may not know what to do, but our eyes are on you. So the text continues. The story is not over yet. Here's what it says. Then the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jehaziel, the son of Zechariah, the son of Benaniah, the son of Jael, the son of Madaniah, the Levite of the sons of Asaph in the midst of the assembly. And he said, Listen, all of you Judah and you inhabitants of Jerusalem and you King Jehoshaphat, thus says the Lord, do not be afraid nor dismayed because of this great multitude for the battle is not yours but God's. <sighs> Man, I wish, I wish, I wish we could all believe that. And that's why we have to be reminded time and time again, people of God, we are not in this fight by ourselves. The battle is and always has been the Lord's. And guess who said that to the people? It wasn't the king. It was somebody that the Spirit chose among the assembly. Why does that matter? Don't miss this, because so often we expect our pastors and our leaders to give the word, to, 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 to be the mouthpiece of God. But will it surprise you if the Spirit actually speaks through one of you? Because the last time I checked, we are called to be a kingdom of priests. That means that you and I have equal access to God, and we can be used equally by the Spirit. So if God speaks through you or he speaks through me, it doesn't matter who the mouthpiece is because the Spirit speaks. And the Spirit speaks consistently. The battle is not yours. It is God's. And I love what he says next because this blows my mind Tomorrow go down against them. They will surely come up by the ascent of Ziz, and you will find them at the end of the brook before the wilderness of Jeriel, and you will not need to fight in this battle. Time out. Let's put this on park. There's three armies with other allies coming to destroy us. We're praying to you for an escape. It would be nice if you could tell us if we go to fight them, we'll beat them. That would be nice. But he tells them, you don't have to fight. I know for some of us men here, that, that doesn't resonate with us because we always want to fight. Or maybe there's somebody here that knows that feisty person, that Sabbath school class that's always just fighting you. Or maybe that's just my churches. <laughs> and if my members are watching right now, I love you, God bless you. You should be listening to your speakers in your churches. <laughs> but he says that the battle is not yours. You will not have to fight. Position yourself, stand still, and use the salvation of the Lord who is with you. O Judah and Jerusalem, do not fear or be dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them, for the Lord is with you. Not the Lord will be with you. Not the Lord was with you. It says that the Lord is with you. He's a present help in every single struggle. He's a present help in every single trouble. He's a present help in every single problem that you have. Not just individually, but collectively as a church. And so he says, verse 18, Jehoshaphat bowed his head with his face to the ground, and all Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem bowed before the Lord, worshiping the Lord. And the Levites of the children of the Kohoahites and the children of the Kohorahites stood up and praised the Lord, God of Israel, with voices loud and high. All right. Here's the thing. We often give praise to God after the fact. You hear what I'm saying? When we do praise and worship, it's like, I praise God that he helped me overcome this. Nothing wrong with that. But I wonder if we ever hear praises claiming victory before the actual event happens. So instead of praising God, oh yeah, God helped me beat cancer, what if we said God is beating cancer right now? What if God has already given us the victory? Will our praise and prayer have a little bit more oomph? You know what I mean? 
Because I love it whenever we have church services and we sing songs like, Praise God from whom all blessings flow. I love seeing the men especially. Praise God from... Whoa, what is going on? Are we still waiting for God to give us the victory or are we claiming by faith the victory already? That's why we can praise God before the fact. And he was trying to teach this young king, no matter how faithful you are, you still need to respond by faith. And so here's the thing. So they go worshiping. They rose early in the morning, verse 20, in the morning, and they went out to the wilderness of Tekoa, and they went out. Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear me, O Judah, and you inhabitants of Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God, and you shall be established. Believe his prophets, and you shall prosper. And when he had consulted with the people, he appointed those who would sing to the Lord and who should praise the beauty of holiness as they went out before the army, and they were saying, Praise the Lord, for his mercy endures forever. So instead of soldiers leading the people, it was the people that praised God. You know what qualifies a praise team leader? It's not their ability to sing. It's not their ability to play instruments. It's simply someone that has learned to praise God before the fact. And so I want you to see this because it's almost comical if you think about it. They are marching to go face these armies in battle and King Jehoshaphat said, all right, tenors and sopranos, you go first. Can you imagine being a tenor or soprano? It's like, I think we need to be in the back, Jehoshaphat. I think you need to be in the front. But the people that were praising God went first. Why? Because we need to lead by praise. Oh, man, I wish, I wish we led with praise more often. Instead of leading with pessimism for the future, how about we praise God for what he is doing and what he's about to do? Because we see as they are marching to battle, we see that when they began to sing and to praise God, the Lord set ambushes against the people of Ammon, Moab, Mount Seir, who had come up against Judah, and they were defeated for the people of Ammon and Moab stood up against the inhabitants of Mount Seir to utterly kill and destroy them. And when they had made an end to the inhabitants of Seir, they helped destroy one another. So when Judah came to a place overlooking the wilderness, they looked toward the multitude, and there were their dead bodies fallen on the earth. No one had escaped. Now when Jehoshaphat and his people came to take their spoil, they found among them an abundance of valuables and the dead bodies and precious jewelry, and they stripped them them off themselves more than they could carry away, and they were three days gathering swell because there was so much. So what looked like a defeat and said became a blessing. It was over before they even got there. There's a story about a man named Jim Simbala. Maybe some of you are familiar with his name. He is often attached to the book Fresh Wind, Fresh Fire, a book about prayer. But probably more famously, he and his wife especially were the ones responsible for raising up the Brooklyn Tabernacle Choir. Maybe some of you are familiar with the Brooklyn Tabernacle Choir. Well, he and his wife never intended to go into any kind of pastoral ministry. They were in New York. They were attending a small church that was old, decrepit, and probably about to die off when the last member died. And the pastor of that church who was about to retire then told them, hey, the Lord told me that you guys are going to pastor this church next. So they prayed about it, and they accepted the call. And they noticed that the church was in incredible disrepair, there were only a few old saints still in the church, much like a lot of our churches today. And they thought of something revolutionary to do. They said, why don't we pray? So they prayed. And they prayed. Every Wednesday night, they came. The, the three saints still left in the church, they prayed together. They started to Wonder about where is the money going to come from? Where is this, where, how are we going to repair our facility? A check came in the mail. 
with more than enough to cover the repairs. So they said, okay, maybe this prayer thing works. So they kept praying and praying. And not only did God bring money, God brought people to the point where that little church in New York City grew to where they had to actually sell it and expand to a larger building. His wife then started the Brooklyn Tabernacle Choir, which has now become world famous. Jim Simbala became one of those pastors, the much sought of after pastors, that would get invited to all these seminars and all these places around the world, teaching them about church growth, teaching them about church leadership. And all the while, he was hiding something in his heart. His eldest daughter, who he and his wife, with due diligence, raised them, raised her rather in the church. From a very young age, taught them the Bible, took them to Bible school, you know, did all of the things that you do to raise your children in the faith. She became a teenager. And she started, uh, she started seeing a guy. I know this might be traumatic for some of you parents right now. But more so, she started to involve herself in activities that we would consider less savory in nature. And what broke his heart was that one day she walked away. I don't need to be part of the church anymore. I don't need this. All the while, this man is going from city to city, country to country, preaching and teaching about God. In his own family, he was broken. And so, one night, he was home, and he was at his prayer meeting in his church. And he was up leading the congregation in prayer, and he was telling them about If we prayed boldly, God is going to follow through all the while in his own heart. He is bleeding. And as they are gathering together to pray, this old saint comes up to him and slips him a piece of paper. And the piece of paper said this, Pastor, we are praying for you. the floodgates broke open. He started to break down crying. And he confessed to his congregation, my daughter has left the faith. And here I am being a pastor. And I can't even save my own child. He couldn't lead prayer meeting. He just broke down crying. And the church members surrounded this man, laid their hands on him, and prayed over him. Prayed for his daughter. Later that night, when he went home, his wife was sitting at the table waiting for him. And she noticed that he looked different instead of tired and distraught. There was something different about what he looked, so she asked him, Honey, what's going on? And he simply replied, it's over. It's, it's over. Honey, what do you mean? I don't, tonight we prayed. Yes, it's tonight's prayer meeting and you prayed, but no, 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 something's different. When, when the church surrounded me and, and prayed over me, prayed over our daughter, there was something that just spoke to me and told me that it's over. Okay. They went to bed that night. The next morning, he's in the bathroom shaving. His wife knocks on the door. Honey, come downstairs right now. I'm shaving. Can't this wait? No, no, come down right now. So he gets his towel with still his shaving cream across his face, going down the stairs. And lo and behold, right there, crumpled into a prone form, is his daughter, disheveled, distraught, eyes, bloodshot. And you would think that somebody with all his years of ministry would have something to say. But at that moment, he had nothing to say. 
And she looked at him. You could tell she had been crying all night because her makeup was running. And she said, Daddy, who prayed for me? What do you mean, honey? Who, who prayed for me? Honey, we prayed for you last night. All of us, we prayed for you. He said, Daddy, last night, I had a dream. No, I had a nightmare that I was being sucked into darkness. And no matter how much I screamed and clawed and fought, I couldn't get out of it. <laughs> and then Jesus came and pulled me out. Daddy, who prayed for me? It was over. Through the power of prayer, the devil's hope was broken over his daughter. And today, she is not just in church, she's leading a ministry. I wonder, people of God, I wonder if any of you have someone in your own life that you need to pray for right now, that you need to claim by faith, just like this man. Perhaps you don't have the strength to pray anymore, but you need the ministry of the church right here, right now. I'm talking to you, saints of God. I don't care how long you have been in the church. Somebody here right now needs to join me up here in the front because they have a son. They have a daughter. They have a father. They have a mother. They have a cousin. They have somebody they know that if they don't get prayer right now, they're going to slip into the darkness. Is there somebody here today that is carrying a burden on their hearts that you need God? God, if you don't intervene right here, right now, nothing is going to happen. Is there somebody here today, young and old, don't worry about what the person next to you is going to say. It doesn't mean that you're any less faithful. The fact that you are coming up here right now is because you are seeking God by faith. God, we don't know what to do. I've been praying. I've been praying and I've been praying for my marriage. I've been praying for my family. I've been praying for my church. I've been praying for my finances. God, nothing's working. God, we don't know what to do. But today, our eyes are on you. Our eyes are on you. Is there somebody else? Perhaps someone in the balcony. We'll wait. Come down. If there is somebody that you know right now that needs the intervention of God right now, come forward. Come forward. I want you to place a hand next to the person that's kneeling next to you or perhaps next to you here in the congregation. I want us to pray a prayer of faith. I want us to pray the same prayer. There's still time. Come forward as we pray. Father in heaven, here we are. God, many of us here have been in the church our entire lives. We've done the church thing. We've preached the evangelistic series. We've done missionary trips. But God, why? Why is it that we are having these enemies still coming at us? Maybe that comes in the form of families being attacked, addictions unable to be broken. And right now, there is a name on our lips. There is a name on our hearts, perhaps two names on our hearts right now that we are praying for. God, here it is. We are praying by the power of your Holy Spirit. We are claiming by faith the promises in your word that even though we don't know what to do, we are saying today, our eyes, our eyes are solely on you. So God, here is the last part of this prayer. Thank you. 
because it's over. Somebody here say, it's over. It's over, Jesus. Chains have been broken. Children have been recovered. God, we thank you because marriages are being healed right now. God, we thank you because it's over. Praise God, it's over. Praise God, it's over. And we claim and we praise these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 It's over. It's over. It's over. It's over. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It's over. God bless you, brother. It's over. Praise God.